I um, wasn't going to make a thing about it, but uh, this is my 10 year anniversary. <laughs> Ten years of Todd in the shadows. Wow, I have no clue what to make of that. It's been, uh, it's been weird. I'm more successful now than I ever dreamed of being. But that was also true three months in when I had 20 subscribers. I've made a lot of videos over the years. I do have regrets. Like when I reviewed the Hannah Montana movie and I would complain about the stupid subplot about, you know, stop the evil real estate developer from building a mall. In hindsight, a mall was a pretty bad investment and Hannah was right to oppose it. And from the little Dicky review a couple months ago, I don't know how or at what cost Dicky produced Kendall Jenner's involvement. I meant procured, not produced, procured. Terrible error, it weighs on me. And um, I guess that's it. Everything else that's happened to me has been great and everything I've ever done has been perfect. It's a weird isolating job and I worry that I've completely tainted one of my main interests by monetizing it, but you know, I look where I started, a broke, depressed alcoholic versus who this job has allowed me to become, a merely mopey, moderate drinker who can afford takeout every now and then. And I say it's been absolutely worth it, and I owe it all to you, so thank you very much for 10 good years. And I figured I should mark the occasion, so I thought, why not take us back to the year I started? Boom, 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 gotta get that. 10 years, that's far enough back to be officially a one-hitter, so let's revisit 2009. A magical year. We had a black president, Crank 2 was in theaters, and music was a hell of a lot stupider and easier to make fun of. Surprisingly though, one-hit wonders were kind of hard to find. A lot of the acts you'd think are one-hit wonders are technically not, and I didn't want to fudge this one so I had to go way down the list, but I finally found the right guy. That party last night was awfully crazy, I wish we taped it. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of remember this being a thing. Man, I love college. Hey! I love drinking. Hey! This is the white rapper Asher Roth, and he definitely did not go to college to get more knowledge. I want to go to college, college for the rest of my life. Sip Banker's Club and drink Miller Lite. Oh, Roth's only hit, his ode to wild frat parties I love college, wasn't exactly huge. It only made it up to number 12 on the Hot 100. But I think it's a fitting track for my 10-year Toddiversary. Because after all, this show started from me and my buddies in college busting on shitty pop songs we heard on the radio. So put on the college t-shirt you got from the university bookstore, turn on some loud music, and break open an ice cold pack of Natty Light. Because we're about to celebrate 10 years of time. Party last night was awfully crazy. I wish we taped it. I wish we taped it. I <laughs> forgot how bad that tastes. How is this the starter beer for college kids? Shouldn't you have to work up to this? Oh. And there's a million of us just like me, who bust like me. Who so back around 2000, 2001, Eminem predicted that he was going to bust open the doors of white rap. There's a concept that works. 20 million other white rappers emerge. As I recall, that kind of didn't really happen for a while. Or if it did happen, all the wannabes didn't really get anywhere. A couple white guys popped up, but nothing like nowadays where white rappers are pretty common. Eminem was the only really big name for a long time. So it was kind of a big deal when this particular white kid started getting buzz. The rough boys in the building tonight. White boy in the beat. How surreal is that? I mean, for real, he's the illest. I hate to kill the cat. I mean, he did sound quite a bit like Eminem, to the point where he eventually wrote a whole song about trying to escape Slim Shady's wide shadow. But he was different, because unlike previous white rappers, he was not trying to prove at all that he was from the streets. He didn't come from the dirty south like Paul Wall, he wasn't violent trailer trash like Slim Shady, he was just some kid from the burbs. And he didn't try to hide it or not sound like it at all. And he was good. His name was Asher Roth, 22 year old kid from Morrisville, PA, near Philly. At this point he was just a sophomore in college, and then he started blowing up from mixtapes that he posted on... Mid... Miss... Miss Pace? Miss... MissPace.com? The song that really grabbed people's attention was his remix of Lil Wayne's A Millie. A million here, a million there, yeah, you got a mill, but for real, dog, nobody cares. If, they, if you don't share, you don't donate to charity. Children who can barely eat, no shoes on their feet. Holy shit, he's going there. It's just these stupid motherfuckers never get it. It's pathetic, yo, they get to the pros and don't do shit like they read it. Well, 
J.J. Reddick eventually developed into a very good NBA player. But you get the idea. He's calling out all the underground rappers who sell out when they get signed. Remember that one. And that's when the major labels came calling. He dropped out to pursue his career and got in tight with a young executive named Scooter Braun. You might recognize that name because Scooter Braun is now one of the most powerful men in music. He has financial ties with some of the biggest pop stars alive. And a couple months ago, he acquired Taylor Swift's entire back catalog, and there was a whole thing about that. Even as far back as nine years ago, you might have heard of him, because at that point, he was already known as the mastermind behind the worst new artist of 2009. I don't know who this kid is, but he fucking sucks. Man, I cannot wait till this little shit's 15 minutes are up. But at this point in the story, Scooter Braun is nobody. He's a newly independent rep trying to Jerry Maguire his way to success. Asher Roth is his first signing. And by the end of 2008, the whole enterprise is within weeks of collapsing. And on month 11 of 13, when I'm done, I'm broke. All Braun has is a white rapper from MySpace and a 12-year-old who makes YouTube videos. Supporting Roth and this kid and his mom has driven him right to the edge of bankruptcy. Scooter is about to give up and we are this close to never hearing of Justin Bieber ever and Taylor Swift has to find someone else to feud with. And then Asher Roth walks in like, hey, I think I've written a hit. 2009 was the year everything became a party. I want to say it was because Obama was getting everyone high off of hope and change. Or maybe it was Flo Rida dominating 2008 and everyone jumping to join in. But whether it be Obama or Flo Rida, two equally important men, it seemed like the entire country was at a non-stop rager. So perhaps it is not surprising that Asher Roth's first major label single was not as thoughtful as his mixtapes. I'm nice right now, man. I, I feel good. It was a song about college parties called simply, I love college. That party last night was awfully crazy. I wish we taped it. Now, unlike the other party jams of 2009, this was not a club anthem. It had an entirely different vibe with the laid back guitar and an equally laid back flow. Which is fitting because it's about an entirely different kind of party. You can practically feel the solo cup in your hand and smell the piles of stale, unwashed laundry drifting down from upstairs. And it also fits because Scooter Braun's big insight about Roth was that white college kids love hip hop, so a rapper who was actually one of them and spoke to them could find a huge untapped market. So first, let me say, I am not opposed to the song in concept. A song about college parties, it deserves to exist. We can't all get in the club, but college parties are open to anyone who has decent grades and willingness to shoulder crippling debt. Now, I can easily imagine people who would be opposed to it because you know, frats suck and frat culture sucks. But college parties aren't just for douchebags. Me and my crew of hipsters and nerds drank as much as anyone. Hell, we even threw our own frat parties. Frat-themed parties. We put on khakis and polos and play shitty music. It was ironic. And in hindsight, by ironic, I mean jealous. So I can't be up here acting like I'm too cool for this. I went to a few frat parties I enjoyed. But more importantly, I've watched and enjoyed frat movies. And honestly, I think every established movie genre needs at least one song to go with it. If we have cowboy movies, we should have cowboy songs. If we have monster movies, we need a monster mash. The stoner comedy has no end of songs for it. College comedies should too. It's not just a movie genre, it's a lifestyle. Surely it deserves its own soundtrack. So I support the song in concept. Do I support it in practice? Well, that's a different question. I want to go to college for the rest of my life. Uh, I like the vibe of it. We need laid back party songs just as much as we need bangers. Although, Bro Country eventually filled that niche, so maybe we don't need it that much. But I do like this beat. This is not even the original beat for the record. That party last night was awfully crazy. The first version used the riff from Weezer's Say It Ain't So, and uh, they just couldn't clear the sample. Honestly, I prefer this version. The guitar playing is a lot warmer, I guess. <laughs> Say It Ain't So is a harsh song where Rivers Cuomo screams about generational alcoholism. Even out of that context, I didn't think the sample fit. Although, Say It Ain't So is absolutely a song you would hear some guy playing on guitar in the corner of a frat party. On the negative, some of the details reminded me too much of what I didn't like about frat parties. I am champion at Beer Pong, Alan Iverson, Akeem Olajuwon. Beer Pong's lame. Sorry. Chug, 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 chug. No, I'm not doing that. And moreover, there's just not a lot of surprises in it. 
Like, you get the point in, like, the first half minute, and it just keeps going. I mean, you don't really even have to listen to the song. You just look at a John Belushi college poster, and that tells you all you need to know. Also, the chorus. Man, I love college. Hey! I love drinking. Hey! I love women. Hey! I love college. I love college. I love drinking. I love women. I love college is not a hook. And that's a shame. Time isn't wasted when you're getting wasted. Woke up today and all I can say is... Time's not wasted when you're getting wasted. That's a great lead-in for a hook. And then there just isn't a hook. It seems like he ran out of ideas. This is more like a college essay. He ran out of time to finish and just scribbled down something for the last paragraph. Then we get the second verse. Don't pass out with your shoes on. Again, this is just a really rote list of college party cliches. I got tits about how to party. And don't leave the house till the booze gone. And don't have sex if she's too gone. <laughs> yeah. What the fuck? Don't have sex if she's too gone. I mean, yes, don't rape. I'm a serious party file, brah. How do you get to the point where you think this is a pearl of wisdom you need to drop? Of course I learned some rules, like don't have sex if she's too gone. Learned that one the hard way, let me tell ya. <laughs> I miss college. Yeah, maybe I'm being harsh. Asher just probably heard all the horror stories about the party scene or saw all those frat comedies where the messages do rape. Still a super awkward thing to bring up on a song this light and stupid, but I guess he thought if he didn't put a disclaimer up there, people would assume. Unfortunately, he follows that with some really terrible advice. When it comes to condoms, put two on. In case you haven't heard this one, no, don't do that. Don't forget to double bag it. No, do not do that. The rubbers will chafe against each other and break. I can't tell you what I learned from school, but... Yeah, Asher, your sex ed classes specifically, we can tell. I mean, if you don't like college parties, this would be why. Even though it's trying to be innocent fun, there's still an unironic and mildly gross atmosphere in this. If I were a college girl, I don't know how comfortable I am at this party. That party last night was awfully crazy. I wish you taped it. I wish you taped it. I danced my ass off and had this one girl completely naked. Drink my beer. It's probably best you didn't tape that, man. She's not gonna want that floating around when she comes to in the morning. Honestly, though, my problem is not that I get a douchey vibe from it or any of the questionable lyrical choices. It's it's just that it's so on the nose. Headstand, headstand, headstand. Like, I try to imagine actually playing this song at an actual college party, and it just feels impossibly lame. Like wearing a band's t-shirt to their own concert. And I can't imagine where else you'd want to listen to it. I think it feels a niche, and it's the right song for the right time, but I can't really say I'm a fan. And it's a terrible first hit to have. It made him look less like a real rapper and more like a cartoon character. But it's not, like, obviously fictional or cartoony enough that he can shed that image either. You just think that's basically him. Just like most frat houses, there's a stink coming off of this song that kind of sticks to you. I love college. Do I really have to graduate or can I just stay here for the rest of my life? In a sense, you very much will, my friend. You will never escape. Sitting on a truffet, puffing on the best cut buds, trying to get butt from Miss Muffet. <sighs> This is, uh, this is his second song, Lark on my go-kart. Razor Ramon flow, oh so sharp. You can take a Powski, I'ma take Lark on my go-kart. That's one of those stupid Flash cartoon music videos, so I'm not sure it's a real single, but it's the only other song from that album, The Crack of Hot 100. And it's, uh, okay, you know how he was compared to Eminem? This absolutely reminds me of Eminem, but not like prime Eminem. I mean Eminem right now, like Venom Eminem. Dick, dick like a salad bowl, like a Allen bowl. You, you get what I mean? Me and Teddy Ruxpin stirring up a ruckus, egging all the houses, smashing all the pumpkins, suck a dick butt kiss. Like a lot of quote unquote clever rhymes and references, but they don't actually say or mean anything. Chumps can't funk with the punk kids. Ashroth be the king of the plumpkins. And a blumpkin is when you get a blowjob while taking a shit. In other words, it's not a thing. It's a dumb frat boy sex joke like the donkey punch or the dirty Sanchez and so on and so on. This is the first track on the album and that blumpkin line alone would have turned me off. She wants to be my lady. He also had a single featuring CeeLo that didn't chart. I'm a free bird. about how he's a player and can't be tied down and so on. 
It's a good hook, and it should feel like it works, but it doesn't. He is nowhere near cool enough or a player enough to write a song like this. That was mainstream rap in 2009. Hot artists would have these mismatched pop hooks shoved on them. Like, I seriously doubt Tyga ever wanted to write a sad breakup song. Thankfully, hip-hop has given up on that shit. And you think I'm the right dude, but there's another girl just like you. It's so obviously meant to be the big radio single, and he just can't do it. In fact, the whole album's kind of disappointing. Asleep in the bread aisle. What kind of name is that for a record? Like, you compare him to Macklemore, who did the same silly but serious white boy shtick a lot more successfully. And Roth seems like he's just not doing it, because he's not enjoying himself as much. He feels like a comedy rapper, but he's not weird enough to be Das Racist. He's not silly and over-the-top enough to be LMFAO. What happened to the kid who seems so sharp on the mixtapes? Where's that guy? Well, about that. Scooter Braun had big, big plans for Asher Roth. Roth and Bieber were going to be his twin rockets to stardom. But that didn't happen. Roth and Braun fell out shortly after the first album. Bieber became his Cuba Gooding Jr. Roth is the other guy that bailed on him. Scooter's explanation for what happened is pretty simple. What Asher also taught me, though, is sometimes artists don't want to be as big as you want them to be. Asher was super happy being who he was. I don't think it's fair to say Roth didn't want to be big at all, but he certainly didn't want to be Scooter Braun's version of big. Both of them say there's no hard feelings, but Roth is just not a guy who you can hand some song he didn't write and tell him that's going to be his big hit. He was not going to be Justin Bieber, and honestly, who the fuck would want to? So he left Scooter Braun, he joined Def Jam, but I get the sense he found the same problems there. You know, dress like this, do a feature with whoever, and it just didn't work for him. His second album, The Spaghetti Tree, never came out because he decided a career at a major label just wasn't for him. Other guys, that sound like an excuse. But Roth seems like someone who genuinely decided he couldn't make the music he wanted to make within the system. And he's been strictly independent since. He grew his hair out, he became kind of a hippie, he moved back to Philly, and he's released a few albums since then, including one with Travis Barker. And I'm not sure I'd recommend his stuff exactly, but his music definitely feels a lot more self-assured and less forced. This is the guy he was meant to be. By contrast, Scooter Braun has since filled the spot in his roster for a goofy white rapper from Philly. I woke up and I'm Lil Dicky. Lil Dicky? <sighs> Roth made the right choice. This is gonna sound kinda weird, but he was good enough that he deserved worse. Chug, chug, chug. If he had not signed when he did, if he had not broken through when he did with the hit that he did, he might actually be a little bigger now than he was. He has kind of a similar energy to Mac Miller. Uh, Miller never had that big crossover, but he maintained a decent fan base and a steady level of success all his short life. It seems like with the right nurturing, Roth could have had that at least. But you can tell he was being pigeonholed and he just couldn't make the restrictions work for him and he burnt out on it all really quick. He is now at the level he seems happy to be at. And maybe at some point if he keeps going, he can escape the shadow of I Love College. At the very least, he knows his one hit altered the course of pop history. Maybe not for the better, but it did. But as not great as I Love College is, there's still a tiny bit of affection I have for it. Roth didn't write it in college, he dropped out to pursue hip-hop and he was already missing it. So if you see it as a song of nostalgia to happier and more carefree days, it does sound a tiny bit better. I've been doing a lot of looking back myself on a weird and wild 10 years. It's, it's been something. So thank you all for the support. I hope to keep doing this and we'll see where it all takes me. Peace. That party last night was awfully crazy, I wish you tasted I danced my ass off and had this one girl Oh! 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 Oh!